series, uh, A Tale of Two Economies. And my guest today is my very dear friend and fellow economist, Mark Anielski from Canada, Alberta. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark is um, has he ch champions what he calls the economy of well-being. Not that he calls the world knows about that, but the economy. Welcome, of Mark. Thanks, Anika. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so it's going to be something between solidarity and well-being. And uh, Mark will tell us more about this, why well-being. Uh, it's the well-being mm -hmm. of our souls as well. And I bring the soul dimension to it. And this is where we both meet in the middle. Yes. This is your book. I yes. This as well. And you work with the, uh, the five capital assets. Right, which is the human hmm. capital, social capital, natural capital, built capital, and financial capital. Mm -hmm. And the iteration starts from, and you know that in my integral, the integral model I have adopted, which is um, uh, which was developed by Ronnie Lessem and Alexander Schieffer and many others. We also talk about starting from the natural community and nature. Mm -hmm. And then going to, you know, spirituality or beliefs and, you know, so this is, this is quite similar anyways, but over to you. Thank you for accepting this uh, invitation to, this would be a series of um, conversations that mm -hmm. we will also compare uh, the, uh, the, the Islamic social, um, social teaching and Islamic concept of economics. And mm -hmm. with the Christian, that would be a series of um, conversations that mm -hmm. we will also compare uh, the, uh, the the Islamic social um, social teaching and Islamic concept of economics, and mm -hmm. with the Christian, Catholic, and Indigenous as well. How do they complement each other? So right. To you, if you can explain firstly the idea of. Uh, Yes, well, Economics of Happiness was my first book. It's kind of behind, uh, I'm pointing yes. to it. Um, and that was written in 2007 before the 2008 financial crisis. <clears throat> and the initial book was actually going to just be called Genuine Wealth because it was my five capital model mm -hmm. uh, with those two words, uh, genuine meaning to live according to our values, right? Uh, to, according to what? According to virtue and what is value, but in Latin to be worthy or strong. So in this book, which was inspired by my students out of Bainbridge Island in the U.S., the Seattle area, they said, you got to write, you know, you've blown our minds with this teaching of economics. Mm -hmm. So uh, so they compelled me to write this book. And But in the process of writing the book, I discovered that the words we use in business and economics have, they still have a kind of interesting etymological truth to them, but we've forgotten what they mean. Mm -hmm. So economy, so then... And it was very hard to explain this integrated five capital model in a, you know, in a 10 floor elevator ride with a friend. So I, it just came out and I said, well, actually, this is about the economics of happiness. And then that became the title of the book. Uh, and it became and it was very popular. Happiness exploded in, in you know, around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and so which was fascinating to me is like why ha why happiness suddenly but for me the you know so the word economy means stewardship of the household oikos household nomia or management of stewardship ecology means lo logia the logic or knowledge of the household mm -hmm. and and i'm a forester so for me it's like the logic of nature or the laws of nature mm -hmm. uh so now we go oh remember we we talk about natural law in the in the Catholic in the Christian teaching natural law, in indigenous teachings they have also these sacred teachings. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't call them natural law; they call them something else. Um, and then the the big word happiness. People are like, how can you put happiness and economy together? I said because happiness lives in the house. But for me, the you know, so the word economy means stewardship of the household, oikos household nomia or management of stewardship. Ecology means lo logia the logic or knowledge of the household mm -hmm. and and I'm a forester so for me it's like the logic of nature or the laws of nature mm -hmm. uh so now we go oh remember we we talk about natural law in the in the catholic in the christian teaching natural law in indigenous teachings they have also these sacred teachings mm -hmm. they wouldn't call them natural law they call them something else 
Um, and then the, the big word happiness, people are like, how can you put happiness and economy together? I said, because happiness lives in the household. And what is happiness? And I say, well, I go back to Aristotle, oidaimonia, meaning oi, meaning well-being, daimonia, spirit or soul. So that's where you and I connect. It's like this is happiness is the well-being of the soul. Well, as a measurement person, how do I measure the well-being of your soul? Can I even do that? Yes. Is it presumptuous to assume I have a glimpse of your soul's well-being. Probably not. But as I then delved into the science of happiness, the psychology, you know, I'm not a psychologist. I'm an economist and a forester with an accounting background. And it's like, okay, the social scientists are saying, well, happiness is derived by three key components. Your upbringing, in other words, the environment which you grew up in, your parents, your household, that's 50%. 10% is only related to your income and your education. And the best news is 40% is related to your relationships with others, which you can affect, right, over your lifetime. So that to me was an exciting proposition that I thought, well, now we have a possibility of rethinking the economy that's not just growth-oriented, and GDP maximizing, mm -hmm. it's well-being optimizing. And well, what does that look like? Well, it, it's a combination of lived reality, so-called objective conditions of well-being and subjective feelings, emotion, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and this has nothing like, you know, I grew up Catholic. I'm not even standing on any social teachings at this point. I'm just saying this was just my inquiry into the language and mm -hmm. restoring the spirit of the words, right? And then the word yeah. wealth means, the, the word wealth actually means the conditions of well-being, competition and Latin to strive together. So suddenly you've got all of this true meaning coming back to a, an interesting proposition, which is, could we now pursue an economy of well-being versus just huh. economic growth? And then you developed something you call a soul print. And this is where I think you and I connected because I have also been writing about this. And uh, I wanted to bring the soul of Islamic uh, teaching or the Islamic, not just economics, just because Islam is the uh, the way of life, right? And we say it's the, the nature, the fitra we as humans have. What is that? That is the soul. And yes, we can't measure that. But because I follow the Sufi path, um, we do have these stations and, you know, stages of how your soul or consciousness as well as well evolves. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, we can't measure it. But I think we can as well. That what stage are you at? The state of your happiness maybe that's correct mm. and i'll just reflect you know building on that my my work with first nations or indigenous there's so many different ways of calling them but actually a lot of the those tribes their names were just simply meant the people right and yeah. we called them all kinds of things we Thanks. we mispronounced their but what they taught me is consistent with the integral model is that the person is comprised of four aspects in a circle, mm -hmm. mental to the north, spiritual to the east, physical to the south, emotional to the west. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means all those four attributes are balanced. Mm -hmm. And your medicine, what they call the medicine wheel, rotates through time clockwise. Mm -hmm. Through what? Volition. Volition in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, so this is like balancing the wheel. stop you here, Mark. Sorry, yes. because... People don't know what you're talking about, the First Nations. Maybe just give us um, some introduction. Yeah, so, so, so First Nations. What have Nation. you been doing with the First Nations people? Yeah, so I, I, I reside in Canada, but Canada actually means sacred or pure place in the Cree language. So I live in Alberta by the Mount Rocky Mountains mm -hmm. and in the West. And the Cree people were like the people that wandered all around what we call North America was called Turtle Island. Why is it called Turtle Island? Because if you look now from Google Earth, it would look like a turtle. Yes. It actually looks like a turtle. Hmm. So, but, you know, people probably laughed, say, what do you mean turtle, Turtle Island? Uh, so, so I work with these original people of Turtle Island, 
which of course were colonized, uh, you know, with the Spanish and Columbus and, um, but they carry uh, an amazing wisdom traditions about life, about creation. Soul. <laughs> soul. They say things like, we don't exist because we, we wrote common law, like the British. Mm-hmm. We exist because we're the creator, we're God's children, period. That's what yeah, we start with. Yeah. So yeah, to keep us we, off that secret as well. Yeah. yeah. And then I've learned that they were given sacred teachings and laws. The great law of peace, for example, was given to the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, uh, 2,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. Because they were feuding, they were very warring people, uh, killing each other off. And then their legend is this man came from across on the water and brought the sacred law of peace to them. And it was the women who carry it in their bodies, in their DNA. Yes. So they have these teachings that still, and then I learned that it was Benjamin Franklin who took that great law of peace and wrote the U.S. Declaration of Independence, inspired by that. So Thank these you. are the stories that I never heard at school or university, which are so compelling. I know. You know, and the other, what what the other Ron, Yeah, this is yeah. what Ronnie and I are also exploring uh, in one episode we did the first one was when what happens when societies lose their spiritual uh intellectual and philosophical grounding right and, you know mm-hmm. exactly like what so, you are saying the foundations are built on that and then we go astray yeah. mm-hmm. so that here's what i've learned is really important language is law okay so we're we're immersed here from pakistan you know we're all from colonies of Great Britain, which are under common law. If you're from France, you're under civil law. Um, if you're in Russia, I don't know what law they have, but whatever. You know, uh, if you're Nigeria, uh, um, again, so lang- because language is law, how we speak, how we understand sacred laws, let's say, laws of nature, uh, defines us as culture, right? And yeah. It's so Russia it's so interesting. You have something called cosmos, cosmism. That was Russia, and the Nigerians have Yoruba, so they all have that. Yoruba. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, anyways, it's so fascinating, and their teachings are are so, um, in a way, very simplified. For example, the the seven sacred teachings or seven laws of the of most most every actually indigenous group in north america are based on these seven sacred teachings and one of the seven is humility there's courage there's respect and there's love Mm -hmm. but when i spoke once i said well i know you have seven sacred teachings and i you know i'll I'll start with love and i was told by an elder woman she said no no you're that's wrong you're wrong order okay i said oh and she said it starts with humility and it ends with love yes and it follows a circle. Yes. It's like your four yes. worlds model, right? And yes. so you. So it's exactly like I think in the Sufi also teaching, it's about humbling yourself uh, in front of your creator. So that is humanity for us because uh, we accept this divinity as well, which is kind of evaporating, it's disappearing from the world. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of complements what you are saying. Yeah. Um, sorry, I. So no, I think I, I think you know, and I just maybe conclude this thought is, so what happens when the British come here to Turtle Island, North America? First the Dutch, first the Dutch in 1600s, and they signed treaty treaties, and treaties are between nations. Mm-hmm. Treaties are like we will walk side by side in mutuality and respect and sharing. Hmm. And uh, these people had no property rights; they didn't understand what it meant to have any own anything because everything was given in abundance by the creator but for us for europeans it's like go and conquer um you know the and the catholic church brought the papal bull of terra nellius that land is empty go and subdue it and all those red indians whoever are savages to be converted right so so what we what we brought is our laws and we then put the laws on the land and impose them on an indigenous people who had these ancient teachings, which are really common sense. Holistic. So, they were just yeah. holistic teachings. It wasn't so in a way, that's right. So we're all 
and so many of us come from colonized countries. So we've all lived under common law for hundreds of years. Still living, and so, I think. Yeah. Still and we're living. all kind of traumatized. And then when, when we start to wake up to like, wait a minute, laws can be rewritten or written. Uh, the law of love could be written. The law of humility could be written. You have done that as well. So yeah. Maybe so that, in the that's... next episode, you can tell us <laughs> the charter of law. Yeah. But that gives you the scope of what I'm trying, what, what I'm learning from them. And mm -hmm. then what I'm learning is also because I've studied our system, our banking system, our accounting system, say, if you want to play chess, if you want to play poker with against, not necessarily against that system, but restore the notion of treaty walking side by side, what mm -hmm. can our system of Kamala learn from their still existing understandings and teachings Brilliant. and, and it, so this is this is applies to all world religions really because we can that's see it. that yeah the convergence of virtue across all religions that's so. it otherwise we can't especially when you, we we are living in a global economy this is what i say when i was in assisi as well that you know you can't it can't be just islamic Sharia compliant finance or economics all over the world that will never happen because it's not even hasn't been implemented in just the Muslim countries let alone you know the whole world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so this is what the integral finance and economics also suggests that you know the particularity of people and the place it means something for them but then we have to converge as well, you know, from local to global. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to mutual, you know, respect and giving each other that space. But do you think, I mean, I'm not, I'm full of hope as you are. So <laughs> I, it's not doom and gloom. I know that people are waking up to all these realities and we are openly talking about it now i mean i openly bring spirituality into finance and economics and people kind of like why why uh, but i think we are would you say our human consciousness has evolved to that stage that we are kind of embracing all this now yeah i think i mean thank goodness to the for the internet and you know we we are hopefully more educated the word education means to draw forth what's already within you you know hopefully that which is within us is the gifts of our spirit that we're a we're in touch with even that like why are we on this planet what's your vocation what's your calling what's your like yearning passion mm -hmm. let alone like okay why do you study mathematics in school if if you're not good at mathematics like uh so i think there is a rate uh, an increasing in consciousness which really just is an increasing of awareness mm -hmm. uh, at the same time there's almost like an orwellian perhaps like pressure to like create a conformity or mm -hmm. artificial intelligence so like what happened to original intelligence mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. why are we rushing into artificial intelligence when bots can't they don't have a spirit they don't have a soul yeah. Yeah. you know uh so these are the things you know of course we're we're an amazing inflection point in in creation um mm. exciting times i mean yeah and to be aware and uh awoken <laughs> awoken. awoken yeah but awaken. but that's that's the thing is be, because it's like making a movie like for me it's like movie making or that notion of what's the story we want to walk into like the yeah. story we've been living okay we 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 know that story we're immersed in that but is is there a different story that we want to storyboard and then walk into that story. This is why we are calling it a tale of two. There we go. Because, exactly. Yes, it's about storytelling and uh, history as well. And you are a historian in economics for sure. So maybe in the next episode, you can also give us a backdrop of uh, where it all started from, Sumeria, and you know what happened. And we can cover all that. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think today, this is enough as an introduction it is enough and it's and the fascinating reflection on it it is only what i have learned and the stories i've heard about those ancient pasts and i may be completely wrong uh, in my interpretation but that's the beauty of how indigenous people live is they they tell the story from their understanding right mm -hmm. and you'd say I well how, yes. you know were you were you a witness to columbus 
on his boat? No, but I heard that story from yeah. my grandmother who heard it from her grandmother and her grandmother. And and so it, it's anyways, it's fascinating. So I in think reflection this is of what I would call faith as well. This is what faith is about, that mm. you know you have to surrender, you surrender and not always challenge everything. This is what the age of reason actually taught us that, you know, otherwise, and I think from a very Sufi perspective, if your heart gives, is the witness, and it gives that um, testimony that yes, mm -hmm. this is true, then, you know, you should just accept it because the secret is um, of creation and God is in our heart chamber. So yeah. if your heart gives that, is stands witness, then you should accept it. This is what my crit criteria is. And I've it's, it's beautiful, right? And, yeah. and all of us know what that feels like. Oh, you, you have this like, that feels true or that feels true. right or doesn't yeah. feel right. You know, that you trust it. You trust that impulse. Yeah. Otherwise, we, it's a rabbit hole. You know, was Jesus real? Was Muhammad real? Was ever here? Quran is a real book and all that. But yeah. you just surrender. That's your faith. You say, I give yeah. testimony. My heart gives, the, you know, stands witness to that. And that is the secret of creation as well. When we took the covenant, this is what it was about. Because we gave yeah, our we're, testimony. We're, we're a covenant people, right? Yeah, that's it. Because we gave our yes to God, to greater. Yeah. Or Or we didn't, you know, or we don't. You know, I did. I'm not sure about you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Okay, Mark. Thank you so much. This was lovely. It's a good start, I think, for both of us. And yes, thank you. Yeah, for the next theme, maybe you can then, we can talk about the five uh, assets, uh, ca asset capital. And mm -hmm. I will also, we can maybe compare it with the way Islamic finance works, which is also asset-based uh, finance. It's not about, you know, creating wealth in thin air as banks do. Yeah, let, let's talk about that subtle distinction between asset-backed versus asset-based. Yeah, that's